ever seen the movie Being John Malkovich? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one of the scenes in it, it's, it's a weird movie. I couldn't even begin to describe it, and I saw it ages ago, so I don't even remember it. So even after, even immediately after seeing it, I probably couldn't describe it. But but now forget about it. But anyhow, the one scene I remember is there's a scene in a restaurant where every character turns into John Malkovich, yeah. and all they're doing is saying, repeating over, Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. That's that's like the, the only word in their conversation. And sometimes I feel like that teaching class because I feel I come in and just start maintainability, maintainability, maintainability maintainability because so much of what we're talking about relates to that and again so much of what we do is to make it easy to change our code because we know change is inevitable you know change comes in from all sorts of forces you know change comes in because a company changes their internal policy change comes in because the government changes something and you have to change you know I'm talking in very general terms not just on, on websites but you know if there is a change in taxes for example payroll processing programs have to ac account for that if there's a change in the withholding law or whatever um, changes could come from uh, your organization expanding you know maybe you weren't interested in converting currency to Canadian dollars, but all of a sudden now you got a Canadian division or something like that. Companies merge. You know, there's so many reasons for things to change, but, but we know that change is inevitable. All right? And therefore, so much of what we do in software design is, in creating software, is, is meant to sort of mitigate that. All right? There's a very famous graph, and, and pardon me if I've shown this to you before, uh, it, it, I, I'm sure I showed it to you in some other class, but I didn't in this class. But the graph shows, like, how far along the project you are and the cost to make a change. The cost to make a change is this, on this axis. The, the point of the project or the stage of the project is here. So here, you might have the, the uh, you know, the uh, um, analysis phase. That's where we're simply looking at what we need to do. And here's the design phase. And here's the build phase. And here is the testing phase. And finally, here is the implementation phase. In other words, the system has finally gone live. The point of this is, is that the cost to change something once it's implemented is many times more expensive than the cost to change something when you're just sitting around the table talking about it, all right, which makes sense. The, the analogy which holds is like if you are building a house. If you're, let's say you hit the lottery and are, are building a, a house and you're, you're working with the architect and the builder and you decide, no, I don't need three bathrooms, I need four bathrooms. At that point, it will add some expense to the project because they have to go change their plans and all that. But compare that to what the cost will be and cost expressed as the cost to make the change, cost expressed in the inconvenience that it's going to cause you, and so on, once the house is built. All right, it's going to be much more expensive at that point. So there's two things that we do to mitigate this. I mean, this is, you know, the, the first day someone wrote software, this graph was true. <laughs> All right? So this isn't some new thing, you know. <clears throat> when the sun expands and wipes out the earth, all right, the last programmer working is going to be working under this assumption as well. All right? So this is like as true as uh, of an axiom as you can make. All right, because it's logical, it just makes sense. All right, there's two things that we can do with this. One is we're going to spend a lot of time in these phases to make sure we have down as good a thing, uh, as good of a plan as possible. All right, that's why again, you know, um, when given an assignment, it's best to take kind of take a step back. Now, I know a lot of the homework assignments in this class are smaller. All right, they're, they're not that gargantuan, all right? The tuition one requires some thought and, and all that. 
But it's better to go and spend some time planning what you're going to do, and certainly when you start talking about larger projects. Plan what you're going to do, figure out what you really need to do, plan what you're going to do before you start building, because that is a place to catch your mistakes, not after you have created it. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to ad adopt good programming practices. All right? In good programming practices, what it will do is it will flatten out this curve a bit. So maybe instead of boom, like that, where this is the adequate programs, programs that just do their job but aren't particularly easy to maintain, maybe good programs will give you a graph that looks like that, and maybe excellent programs will give you a graph that looks like that. The one thing to note, if you haven't noticed, is in mathematical terms, this is increasing at an increasing rate. So it's not simply a linear increase. It actually kind of skyrockets, all right, and the further along you go. So later on in this course, we're going to talk about design, because you're going to have a project to do, and we're going to go through a design phase first. The idea being, hopefully you'll figure everything out in this phase. Design can mean many different things. Um, a, a lot of people associate design with sort of the veneer of a product, all right? And um, it's actually, you know, I've had that thought for a while. Uh, actually, I'm reading Steve Jobs' biography, and in there he uses those exact terms. The, the People think of the design as the veneer, the surface, where the design is the product. The design is the guts of the product and what makes it work, all right? So a lot of people, when they talk about web design, they think in terms of the colors, the fonts, and all that. That's the veneer. That's the surface. The real design, especially when we start getting into database-driven things, is the database design. All right? Um, the design of the classes that we're going to use. All right? The design of the pages in terms of what we can do to make the pages reusable. Any custom classes we have, and so on. That's the real design. All right? Not to mention things that are in common with all software applications. That is, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? What are the goals that we're trying to achieve, both for ourselves and for the user? And that's what design really is. All right? And so you spend a lot of time there. The other thing, again, is you try to adopt good programming practices. So in the examples that we've gone over the last few classes, we've talked about um, putting our business rules somewhere. Or our, our, I prefer the term problem domain rules, problem domain logic, because, you know, you have this issue even if you're not a business. You know, a college isn't a business, really. But, again, they have rules about certain things. A nonprofit isn't a business, but it has rules. So I prefer the term the organizational or the problem domain uh, um, uh, issues. And we've, we've seen how we can create custom classes to encode that logic in there. Those are, there's also a discussion in the textbook um, that you should take a look at that, that I'm not going to talk about in class. I, you know, I could answer some questions if you want. But about making custom um, user controls. In other words, if you have a certain thing, certain form control, um, or set of form controls that maybe are going to be on a bunch of different pages. You can make your own custom form control, all right? Maybe a text box and a validation, or maybe two text boxes and a validation all rolled into one. And then, just like now you add a text box, you could add your form control and you'll get both the text boxes. So, review through that in the book. Uh, I, won't, I won't spend uh, time in class talking about that. But again, it's something that can come in handy. And again, why do you do that? You know, Malkovich, right? Maintainability. All right. What we haven't addressed is maintainability and its cousin, reusability, in terms of the user interface. And that's what we're going to talk about starting today. All right? Remember, these ASP.NET controls, what they're meant to do is 
take some of our development goals and make them easy to do. And again, they're meant to consider very common goals that web developers will have. So that's why, you know, if you think back, we talked about validation controls. You know, what web developer doesn't need to validate form data? There aren't any, right? That's a very common need. All right? So therefore, there's components that help us do that. So let's think of a couple of common needs in terms of user interfaces, and we'll address how these can be created and, and, and implemented. Again, the one thing that I mentioned that's in the book is we can create our own user form controls or, or, or user custom user controls. So there's that. But a couple goals to have. Let's, let's pull up some page at someone yell out a site. Boy, I, boy! I was gonna say the instant I said that, I realized that that could be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I trust you. Someone name a name a popular site that would be appropriate for me to discuss in a class. Amazon. Amazon, perfect. I do have the fear of typing in a URL wrong in class because, <laughs> you know. Occasion, unscrupulous people will register a domain name close to a popular domain name, and usually it's not to like put out ASP.NET tips. So I try to be real careful and double check and triple check. All right, we're gonna look at Amazon. Do I turn that on? Yeah. If we're gonna look at Amazon. We'll see that as we navigate around here. Notice what this part of the page looks like. And notice what this part of the page looks like. And notice what this part of the page looks like. As we navigate around, let's see what today's deals are. Wow, I... Yeah, I actually could use a new watch. I, had. I don't know, if people use watches today? That's probably why there's such a big discount, right? I just look at my... Oh, yeah, some do. All right, but notice... Boom. Same thing as on the other page. Boom. Same thing there. Boom. Same thing there. All right. Let's go to another page. Let's look at gift cards. Oh, looky there. Boom. Boom and boom. All right. Someone name another website. Pardon me? eBay? Okay. All right. Notice the top. Ooh, Lego Battles. <laughs> I know one of the guys that works in the Lego games. Oh, those are the best games. I have cleared... I have played and cleared Lego Star Wars more times. Me and my, uh, like by myself with my daughter, you know, it's like that is like one of my all-time favorite games. Really? I actually saw on Netflix there are some Lego animations still going. All right, let's go here. Fashion. That's obviously not me to look at. <laughs> Electronics. Okay. Now let's notice something a little bit subtle difference here. We still have a consistency in the way the page looks. But notice how structurally, here we're in the electronics section, I go into computers and tablets, the menu changes a little bit. But if I go to laptops and all that, all right, the menu changes and all that. Let's see, PC, laptops. So this didn't do exactly what I was expecting, but still, the idea is, is consistency doesn't mean the pages are going to be identical, right, in structure. It means there's going to be some elements that are the same universally, 
In other words, I'll bet every single page on eBay's site has this on the top. I bet that every single page on Amazon's site has their stuff on, on the top. But then there's going to be sections that have stuff in common too, right? So for example, let me go into and shop for books. All right, over there. So I can search for some books. Let's search for Jeffrey Zeldman. I spelled it wrong. All right. Let's go and search for, and notice as we're doing this, What's along the top there? Was that on the home page? No. But every book page is going to have that on there. So if I search for someone else, wrong Eric Meyer. Maybe it's Eric Meyer's. Oh, related search, Eric Meyer's CSS. There we go. That's the guy I was interested in. Notice again, there is the same. Now, if we went into CDs, CDs, haha, uh -huh, I'm funny. Went into music and search for the Beatles, a, a, a new band that's causing quite a stir. I, I <laughs> that. Notice that that's different, right? It's different than books. But as we go and navigate around to different things in the music section, um, it, 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 it's, it's consistent within that section. The other thing to notice is if we look at the products, if we go to any of these products, the, the layout is generally the same. There's like some blanks that get filled in, right? This part is in common for every music page. Then we're going to have a picture of the item here. Then we're going to have some description here. Then we're going to have customers who bought this always bought, and so on down the line. And I could go to something else, and I see the same thing. All right? No image available, okay? But still, customers who bought this also bought, and so on down the line. So, what we see here is that. And if we, you know, if we went to eBay, it would be the same thing. If we went to ESPN, it would be the same thing. If we picked any like popular website, we could probably make these observations. Even LC's website, you know, as you go around, there's some things that are common on every page. Some things that are common for a section of a page. Then there's some blanks that get filled in with specific content. All right. So that's a common goal to have common things, common things across the site. Common, common things for a subset of the site, and then have some blanks that get filled in. Well, if you think about doing HTML, all right, and know that we're, we're writing server-side scripts, all right, we're not writing HTML. But if we were writing HTML, and we had a navigation menu on the top of our page, all right, um, and that navigation menu changed, we'd have to go and change every single instance that we want to change that navigation menu. And what, of course, is going to happen? I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to cut and paste wrong. I'm going to forget to do one. A lot of bad things could happen when you have to do the same thing over and over again. All right? Um, and our focus is diverted to maybe some changes or enhancements, which actually could make a big impact. Right? If, if you're spending all the time working out the, doing the grunt work, you can't do any of the really cool stuff. All right, so there's what's called an opportunity cost. And the opportunity cost is factored into that cost that goes up as well. If I'm spending all my time bug fixing, I'm not adding any new features to the site. Or if I'm spending all my time in routine maintenance, like we want to change the color on every page to red, and I didn't use CSS effectively, and I have to go into every page and change it to red, then that's a lot of time I'm going to spend that I could be spent making more, sub, more substantive changes. 
All right. So, what can we do? And, and, and again, even if you assume that each product page isn't a separate HTML page, you still have the book's home page. You still have the author's search page. You still have the product page, and so on down the line. So there's still going to be a lot of pages, even if you assume that there isn't an individual HTML for every single book or author search or whatever. you still got a lot of them. So what can we do to fix that? And what we can do to fix that is, in ASP.NET, is the use of what are called master pages. All right? Master pages are pages that you can put common content in. All right? And you can actually put this content in several layers deep. So in other words, you could have a top-level master page for every page on the site gets this stuff. You can then have a second-level master page where not every page gets this, but every book page, every music page, every computer science page, whatever gets these things. And you can go further on down the line as far down as you want to go. So you can nest master pages. So what we're going to look at first is we're going to look at just the first level. I'm going to create something that I want to have on every single page. All right? And when I do that, uh, again, you know, I'll, I'll pay a little bit of attention to the appearance, but I'm not really going to focus on the appearance too strongly. All right? I'll just do some very basic stuff, put some CSS styling in, and so on. Now, if you think of... A pretty common layout for pages, it would look maybe something like this. Let's consider, you know, a very simple website. For a very simple website, this might be a reasonable sort of layout, right? You could move the navigation and maybe have it go horizontally, or you could put the navigation on the other side, or whatever. Yeah, you have a little bit of, of variance on exactly how to do that. But this would probably be a fairly typical layout for um, a site. Now, the question comes in, you know, if we build our scripts, and again, even forgetting about individual HTML page, if we build our scripts to this layout, what if someone wants to add another section, like a news section, on every page? Well, we'd have to go back to every ASPX page and add that section in. Not so when we have master pages. Or if we want to change the banner. Or we want to change uh, this. Effectively, what we're doing with the master pages is we're doing for content what CSS has done for appearance. That is, we're putting certain pieces of content that's in common in a single place that multiple pages can refer to. And if we need to change it, we only change it in one place. So let's go in into ASP.net and let's create a new site and let's use a master page. using C sharp and we'll put it on the desktop and we'll call it project okay and away we go So we got our project with our web config file. First thing I want to do 
is I don't want to just run off and start making pages, right? Because if I start running off and start making pages, then if something changed about the page, then I'd have to change it. And I'm going to take the assumption that for this page, I'm going to use that layout like I had over there, which showed um, which showed a banner, navigation, content, and footer. We're going to assume for this simple website that the banner, navigation, and footer are the same on every page. So that's going to be our assumption. So we're going to build those into our master page, right? Because the master page is the place for common content. What is going to be different from page to page? The content area, exactly. So we're not going to have the content in the master page, because that's different from page to page. We're going to have a placeholder. We're going to have a blank that will get filled in by each specific page. So let's go in here and say file, new, file. And I'm going to pick a master page. All right. Now, if we look at this, it looks like sort of any other page that we've developed in ASPX, except there are two additional things that aren't on a regular, regular web form. And those two things are a new tag, content placeholder. There's a content placeholder here, and there's a content placeholder here. These are the blanks that are going to get filled in on each specific page. All right? These are the blanks that are going to get filled in. So we're not going to put anything in them in the master page, right? Because this is, this is a section that's going to be different on every individual page. Now, they give you two of them by default. They give you one that lives in the head and one that lives in the body. If you wanted more, if there was a certain section of the page, if there were two little blanks on the page, two placeholders on the page, you could add a placeholder if you wanted to. But in this simple case, there's really no need to. So we'll keep it like this. So what am I going to put in here? I'm going to put in the stuff that's common. So I'm going to put in my header, and H1 that says Zellers Incorporated. A nav, which at some point is going to have my list of links. And what are, what are navigations? List of links are usually ULs that have LIs that contain the link. So I'll put in a link for the home page and I'll create a couple dummy pages. Maybe there's an About Us page and a Contact Us page. I'm going to change this in keeping with the theme of um, HTML5. I'm going to say change this to a section tag. Okay. 